record on this computer. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. We have Dr. Robert Divis. He is a board certified doctor that specializes in obesity and weight management. And he's here with us from Florida, South Florida. So we're so excited. This is going to be awesome. Please stay tuned. We're going to have so much information about weight loss and um, carnivore diets, keto diets. It's going to be really fun. So stay tuned all the way to the end. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you so much. Uh, so tell us how you became the carb addiction doctor. Well, you know, I'm a throwback to way back. I was fat myself. I weighed about 300 pounds. And what I tell people is this may have changed, but this never changes. Uh, and what I realized, uh, I'm actually, my background is in pediatric surgery. So I was dealing with a lot of kids, babies, and children that were obese or you know, children shouldn't have the adult type metabolic diseases. I was heavy myself and I started seeing gallbladder disease, polycystic ovarian syndrome and morbid obesity in kids. And in the late 90s, we had no, no ability to help those kids. So I became more and more interested in that. And I think what happens with children is you get to meet their parents as well. So you have the, the insight, not just into the patient themselves when they've been dealing with this for a long time, but in the evolution of the disease. And it became very apparent to me that obesity, number one, was not related to food at all. It was exclusively related to sugar and starch. And that we really have to separate carbohydrates from food um, and, and create a distinction between the two. So when we eat carbohydrates, they're not necessary for human survival, but they give us pleasure. And I found what these kids were doing was relying more and more on sugar and starch as a way not just to give themselves pleasure, but to give themselves reprieve from all of their emotions. When they were bored, when they were stressed, when they were anxious, their parents were feeding them this crap and they were eating or to demanding it. So it was very obvious with, with patients I was seeing for other reasons to see that connection and to see it in myself. When I had a rough day, the ice cream was my friend. M&Ms were my friend throughout the day. So that connection became very obvious. Now, remember, we're flying in the face of all the conventional wisdom that you have to eat carbohydrates, that there's a, an advantage to athletes for eating them, that kind of thing. But I rapidly realized that I was seeing two types of kids. My normal, healthy, lean kids that were coming in for other surgeries, hernia surgeries and stuff like that, they just didn't have that reliance on sugar and starch. And then the metabolically challenged diabetic or obese kids, it was just so distinct and it was so obvious. And as long as you have an open mind, and I was fortunately trained in, in a medical school system that was very inquisitive. It, it trained us to ask why. So I looked at these patterns and I looked at myself and I said, this is so obvious. And I began to look at that more and more in our patients. And as I started becoming interested in bariatric surgery, obesity surgery, I also realized that the surgery was very effective at losing weight. Diets are great for weight loss, but they don't treat obesity. And obesity is the relationship a child builds up or a human then builds up with sugar and starch as an instantly available emotional support system. But the other thing I realized is that the same kids, the same people who have this predilection for sugar and starch are also those with the least effective alternative emotion management system. And I looked at these kids, young kids, four or five uh, years old. And in fact, what's interesting is the fastest growing demographic of obesity in our country are two to five-year-olds, two to five-year-olds before they know they're human. And, and those kids all have a comprehensive deficiency of effective emotion management strategies. The entire world revolves around sugar and starch. And I looked at myself and I said, you know what? You're not that different. So there are tools available where we either don't use them or can't use them. And out of that evolved the substance abuse uh, paradigm rather than the nutritional weight loss, calories in, calories out, the conventional crap that never worked for me. I mean, I'm an expert at failing weight loss programs. But once I treated it from an addiction perspective of removal and replacement, and the interesting thing about carbohydrates is carbohydrates fill two massive voids in our lives. They fill a nutritional void, void, albeit not very well, 
and that creates physical ill health. And they also fill a fundamental emotion management role that causes mental health disturbance. And if you show me a fat person, I'll show you a person with mental health issues. It's just that simple because they're using both as not very good um, ways to manage those two holes. So if you just focus on a diet, and let's say you're on a keto diet or a carnivore diet, yeah, you remove the carbohydrates and nutritionally you become better. But if you're not aware of it, you also leave a huge emotion management void. And if you don't fill that void intentionally, it's just a question of time before life throws you a curveball. And the only option you have is to default relapse back to sugar and starch or to some other drug. You know, a lot of people who successfully quit smoking, they're so proud they quit smoking, but they gained 50 pounds. They didn't quit smoking. They just went from, from nicotine to carbohydrates without realizing it. So that was the fundamental, just the observationally, that was the fundamental part. There was some science background as well, because I did my PhD looking at sugar. And all the questions we asked were, we got exactly the opposite answers. And it didn't make sense to me. But once I put my, obs my clinical observations with kids and with myself, together with my science, it was so obvious. And I think the mistake I made and the mistake a lot of keto people make is when it's so obvious to us, we expect it to be obvious to everybody else. And it just isn't. Because I'll give you another, another just a brief example of what happened this week. For 20 plus years, I've known that eating saturated fat is absolutely fine. There's no harm to it. In fact, actually, there's a harm to not eating it and it's tremendously beneficial. And it was so obvious to me, yet Everybody I advocated to this, my colleagues told me, oh, you're killing people, that's malpractice, it's terrible. Well, this week, the American Heart Association comes out with a review paper, I don't know if you saw it, that says, hey, it's okay, saturated fat, there's no evidence to support the fact that saturated fat causes harm. We've been saying that for 20 years and told we're idiots and we're terrible and we're harming people. Now, suddenly, because an organization that has been harming people through their message suddenly turns the corner, and I'm grateful and thankful they have, now suddenly it's okay. But I'll tell you this, it's going to be a huge mind bend and probably a shift most doctors are not going to be able to make, despite the fact, despite the fact that the American Heart Association says it. And if I can, if you permit me to make one more anecdote, if you look at pediatricians who I deal with quite a bit, the majority of pediatricians recommend, and you're going to encounter this in a little bit, recommend skim milk for babies, okay? Now, the American Pediatric uh, uh, um, Association, the uh, APA, the, I can't remember the exact acronym for the society, but the large society of, of American pediatricians have done five studies comparing uh, skim and 1% to 2% in whole milk and looking at this in kids between the ages of two and five years of age. And statistically, every single one of them has, has found significant differences between those kids that drank whole milk versus those that drank skim milk in terms of obesity and uh, immune diseases, allergies, that kind of thing. So, and it strongly favors saturated fat. It strongly favors um, whole milk. And yet, on the front page of their website, and you speak to most pediatricians, they still will tell you to drink skim milk, or maybe 1%. So even though the data is there, even though the evidence is there, their belief is so intense that they can't alter their belief to support or, or to change their mind with the science. And we're gonna see the same thing with saturated fat. It's gonna be a while before most doctors come around to the fact that that's okay. No long, I know that's a long story, but that's kind of the backstory. That's, that's great, that is so, I mean, it's so scary because I feel like the people who are the most impacted are maybe the poor people who don't have any any of their own information or they can't make their informed choices as much as people who have more money or can go to different doctors or something like that. Um, so <clears throat> a lot of a lot of the, the people now in carnivore. The, some of the leading voices are saying that carbs are okay and that certain carbs are good and and um but i know for people following me and you 
are probably not those people <laughs> that the carbs are are okay for. So um, what do you think that that really means? Well, I think it's, it, it's more conceptual misunderstanding. Okay. Um, obviously you're pregnant right now and I would assume that you not, don't drink alcohol. No. But when you're not pregnant, do you drink alcohol from time to time? Actually, I don't, but... Most, okay, you don't. I'm sorry. Okay, you don't. I do. do. Yeah, I, I do. And I've never really had a problem with alcohol. I've been drunk from time to time, uh, but I drink alcohol from time to time. It is a very valuable tool to me to just dissipate emotional tension from time to time, but I'm not an alcoholic. No bad things in a sustainable way have happened to me. So my relationship with alcohol is absolutely fine. On the other hand, for religious purposes, or if you've been an alcoholic, it's probably not a good idea to drink alcohol. So the concept of alcoholism is not defined by alcohol. It's defined by somebody's relationship with it. If for religious purposes, if for dietary purposes, or if for addiction purposes, you've lost control of or do not want to have a relationship with alcohol, stay away from it. But if you've never had a problem with it, a measurable problem with it, and you want to be objective about it, it's fine to drink alcohol from time to time. Carbohydrates are exactly the same. Carbohydrates are not the problem. The problem is our relationship with it. When you've topped out at 300 pounds and you've had metabolic syndrome, those are markers of an out of control relationship. If you've if you're a skinny person, you've gained five pounds, that may just be a little bit of sloppiness and you just tighten that up and you can eat your carbohydrates. But for you and me who've had distinct harm psychologically from a health perspective, stay away from it because you and I do not have the capacity to control that relationship. So it is not carbohydrates. It is your relationship with it. And, and that's what people don't understand. So I think to demonize carbohydrates as, as, comprehensively is like demonizing alcohol comprehensively. Not a good idea, but we've got to understand two things. Number one, um, who we are as human beings. But number two, also to understand that carbohydrates now are not what we grew up eating as a species. And what we've done is hybridized those carbohydrates to the point that it's like taking cocoa leaves and turning them into heroin. Everybody will tell you heroin is a drug, but a lot of people will tell you cocoa leaves have medicinal value for tribes in the Amazon. A few thousand years ago, before we became farmers, carbohydrates were far, we didn't have access to huge amounts. I recently showed a picture of corn. There was this little thing that almost looked like a grass seed. And if we ate that, we could survive, but it didn't you know, get us high. Now the corn is this huge, big thing. So our, our industry has morphed carbohydrates and made them more concentrated and, and more, more potent. So part of it's the relationship, part of it is that stuff. You know, I don't have, a, I live here in Florida. It, you put anything in the ground, it grows. I don't have a Twinkie tree in my backyard. <laughs> Absolutely. So why do you think some people switch from keto to carnivore? Why do you think it doesn't work in the first place with keto? Well, I think that, that keto is not one thing. I actually not, I'm not a big fan of the word keto. Keto is a word that has been used to describe what I'm now do, what I've been doing for 20 years when the word keto didn't exist. Really what, what you're looking for is the biology of getting your body to preferentially use fat or ketone bodies as its primary fuel source. That's called being fat adapted. And the ketogenic diet is the way you do that by reducing your carbohydrate consumption, whether it's through addiction or something else, you, you lower your insulin uh, rate, your, your insulin resistance, and you become insulin sensitive so that sugar is available when, you're, when your cells really need it, but for the most part, they live on fat. That's what ketosis is about. That's what fat adaptation is about. Using a ketogenic diet as a variant form of caloric reduction and to reduce hunger for the purpose of losing weight is a modification of so many other words, starting with Adkins. In fact, starting in the 1950s um, with folks that were writing about it then. So this is not a new concept, but it's a morphed 
it, it, it's a version of that, whether it's intentional, intermittent fasting or keto or paleo, or these are all variations. And if you don't understand the principle of fat adaptation, you don't get it right. There's too many evangelicals who, oh, this worked for me, therefore it'll work for you. Net carbs work, or you, you're allowed up to 50 grams of carbohydrate, whatever it may be. And that may work for you, but it doesn't work for everybody. And the key thing is to understand what the real issues are. Do you have an addiction to it where you can't control the relationship? Are you an athlete who used it in a mistaken guidance that it had a, a performance value to it? Why are you doing this? And what are your metrics? Are you more diabesogenic? In other words, if you eat carbohydrates, do you become diabetic? Or if you eat carbohydrates, do you become fat? What is your insulin resistance like? And what is your insulin production capacity? So it's much, much more sophisticated than a lay person saying, I'm going on a keto diet. I'll give you an example. Um, South Beach Diet said, we have a keto version. We're doing a high protein diet. They just latched onto the sexiness and the marketability of the word keto. They know nothing about what it is. And, and my concern there is that it really is a bastardized approach. So when you say keto, who knows what it is? Now, carnivore eliminates carbohydrates. Whether you know, you're a carnivore purist or... But basically, when you eat animal products, they pretty much eliminate carbohydrates. So that's the value of, carbohydrate, of carnivore. What I tell people is this, and I know it's going to fly in the face of a lot of people. When you're treating an alcoholic, the only thing that's really important from their fluid management perspective is to not drink alcohol. Nobody tells an alcoholic what they should drink. There are better and worse things. As long as they're not drinking alcohol, that's the key thing. And when we're talking to people who are overweight, have type 2 diabetes, or type 1 with a type 2 overlay, or metabolic syndrome, the problem is carbohydrates, sugar and starch. Eliminate those from your diet. What you eat really doesn't matter that much. If you're more on the vegetarian side, more on the carnivore side, or a hybrid of both, your body is prime. That's the beauty about being human, to eat all of those things as long as it's not carbohydrates. However, it is easier and more effective and simpler to follow a carnivore diet. So in my own life, I've migrated more and more toward carnivore, not because it's healthier or it's scientific, it's because it's easier. I like vegetables from time to time, so I'll eat them, but I eat them for pleasure, not because they have nutritional value that if I don't eat them, I'm going to get malnourished. You can eat a well-balanced vegetarian diet or well-balanced carnivore diet and do, I hate the word balanced, by the way, but a well-formulated one and, and have been nutritionally complete. For me, it's easier to eat carnivore. And I don't know if you'll raise his head here, but my dog is here somewhere in the room. And at the end of the week, when I eat a salad, when I make a salad at the beginning of the week, by the end of the week, if I've got lettuce over, I'm going to have to throw it out because my dog doesn't eat lettuce. At the end of the week, if I've got steak left over, he'll eat the steak. So we never have to waste. So it's more a migration for me of what works. And I can tell you that probably one of the challenging things is when you come from the standard American diet, and authoritarian people will do this, they dive in the deep end of the carb-free pool. They dive into carnivore right away, and they totally carnivore. That austerity is too great, and it's unsustainable. What I tell people is, is your diet is like an elephant. It's massive, it's pervasive, snacks and eating and drinking. You can't eat an elephant in one bite. If you try to do that, you will choke on the elephant. And I've, all too often, I've seen people go carnivore and, and crash and burn. But if you start progressively eliminating carbohydrates from your life, you maybe include some vegetables and, and meat, but you get rid of the uh, starches, the grains, the potatoes, the rices, and you slowly ease into it. If This has to last our entire life. So if it takes you a few weeks to get there, that's not a problem. And in the addiction model, everything that you do eat, even if it's harmful, has value. So if you remove it, you have to replace the value without something that harms you. And that's important psychologically as well as nutritionally. So I ease my patients into it slowly. You want to be the tortoise, not the rabbit. And then we slowly migrate you toward carnivore. Same thing with, with intermittent fasting. I don't like the word fasting because that... I haven't eaten yet today. I was up at 5 o'clock this morning, but I'm not fasting. 
my body just doesn't need nutrition right now. I'm not eating. But so I don't use intentional fasting as a way of life. It may be of value starting out for austere people, for people that want to really hammer this home. And Jason Fung does a great job with that. But long term, it's more about not eating than it is about fasting. It's more about not eating carbohydrates than being pure carnivore. But pure carnivore works really well for me. And then, of course, vegetable. And this is the part that we're just starting to understand. And there's two, two things that I'm actually going to be doing a podcast on, but you're going to be the first to hear this from me, is that there are certain things in vegetables that may trigger autoimmune disease, where it triggers our intestinal system. We know, for example, gluten is one of those. No vegetables, no gluten, no carbohydrates, no gluten. But no human being tolerates gluten. Some people, the disease is obvious. Some people, it's subclinical. But for example, with gluten, there may be cross-reaction to, let's say, your thyroid. So now you've got Hashimoto's disease. And the presence of insulin resistance, um, yeah, so, you know, and, and um, other folks have, have seen that as well. So those are cro- where, where your immune system cross-reacts. It gets triggered by a foreign thing, possibly, not, not definitely, but possibly something we've eaten on the vegetable spectrum. And then we cross-react to something in our own body that looks similar. Uh, and whether that's lupus, whether it's Crohn's disease, we now know Crohn's disease is an autoimmune disease. It is a crossover disease. And you can actually, there's guys in Australia that are curing um, uh, Crohn's disease or putting it into remission by changing the bacterial flora. So when you eat vegetables, okay, certain bacteria thrive on the vegetables. When you eat meat, it's a whole set of bacteria. And I'm not sure the bacteria are the issue, but your body may react to, to vegetable type bacteria that cause cross reaction, whereas carnival bacteria, they don't react to. So that's one of the reasons why you may put autoimmune disease into remission. So one of the things that, that I will be doing a talk on is that vegetarian animals, cows, for example, use certain bacteria that come along with their vegetable food to ferment the vegetable food. And what, even though the cellulose is sugar, those bacteria turn the sugar mostly into fatty acids, and it's the fatty acids that the cow absorbs. When they're eating leafy green vegetables, you can actually make a cow fat or diabetic by feeding them pure sugar that doesn't require the bacteria. But the cow's intestine lives happily with the bacteria in vegetables. Human beings, our intestine has lost the ability to ferment food, to use bacteria to process our food. We do not need bacteria. We need bacteria to make poop, but we don't need bacteria to extract our food. We are primarily enzyme and chemical based. Acid in the stomach and enzymes break our food down. So our intestine works very differently. And the majority of the enzymes are geared to break down fat and protein, a little bit carbohydrate, but mostly fat and protein, which are the essentials that we need. So when we eat vegetable products, they may, and certain grains and that kind of thing, they may bring in antigens that our body cross-reacts with and causes inflammation and autoimmune disease. And you combine that with insulin resistance, and that's where a lot of our inflammatory and autoimmune diseases come from. So being carnivore kind of eliminates that as an option. And, and that's, so it's not just the ease of eating it. At a subclinical or a clinical level, some not it's more about what you're not eating than what you actually are eating. Does, does that make sense? It's a complex answer, and I'll be doing a deeper dive into each of those topics later uh, on, on our websites but, or on our, on our posts, but that's kind of a feeder for you. It's the first time I've spoken publicly about that. Yeah, I mean, I think people are so worried about the microbiome, and they freak out that they're not going to be feeding their good bacteria and then but I always say just try it because within a week you're going to feel so much better and you'll forget about that because you won't be bloated all the time and um, not be able to go the bat and they're so worried about being constipated too and it's like well this is being carnivore is the only thing that ever helped with that so (laughs) well one of two things is going to happen I tell my patient this you're either going to poop or you're going to explode yeah. And I have yet to see someone explode. <laughs> everybody gets constipated. Everybody gets diarrhea. doesn't matter what you eat. 
But over time, as your gut gets used to carnivore, it's another reason to ease into it. You look at Joe Rogan when he suddenly went carnivore. Uh, I mean, his, he was living on the toilet because he had diarrhea all the time. But within two weeks, if you ease your way across and slowly adapt your body, your body just doesn't do things in an instant. But if the system slowly gets better and you use salt, water, and fat, which are the three things that make up soft poop for a carnivore, then your bowel movements, as you said, your bowel regularity becomes so much better. And for pe people with ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, especially if they've got strictures or narrowing, vegetable material plugs that up. But the soft poop from carnivore diet, as long as you're not eating gristly meat and bones, which most of us don't do, um, that softness and this small volume, because most of your meat is being absorbed up front, so there's not a lot to come out. And, and constipation and diarrhea are very simple to understand. If we're going down that pathway, are you okay? Just for a second. I use the fork test. If your poop runs through a fork, that's diarrhea. If you can stick your fork into the poop and you can do this on the, on the desk with your poop and it's a little round hard ball, that's constipation. Constipation is not about how often you go or how much comes out. And sometimes we confuse that. It's the consistency. And I can tell you the most common thing to cause constipation on a carnivore diet is cheese. So what I find, I eat a decent amount of cheese. I use it a lot. I like it. But if I find I'm getting a little bit more on the constipated side, I back off a little bit and I use either oils or butter or, or animal fat to be my fat source for a few days. And believe me, if I overdo that, it goes the other way. So you've just got to understand how your gut functions and it is completely safe. But very quickly, your um, intestinal biome does change, and it changes for the better. Absolutely. I mean, it happened for me and my sister. So, um, and we're more on the slow side than the other than the other side. So, um, you know, and another question people always ask about carnivore is about they think they're going to be nutrient deficient. And especially, of course, they ask me because I'm pregnant, so they think that I'm going to, you know, die of some sort of, or I'm going to hurt my baby because I'm nutrient insufficient. But actually, I feel the I feel more well nourished than I ever have being carnivore than I did eating vegetables and paleo and even keto. So. What do you think about that? So, so I think that's, that's an important, it's a very important consideration. Uh, because again, carnivore, there's carnivore and carnivore. And this is something I personally had to reconcile as I migrated more that way. Because um, maybe a decade or two ago, the principle of carnivore, which came originally from the Eskimos, there were guys that went up and lived with the Eskimos. I can't, I'm terrible with names, but there was a particular doctor about, I think, 50 or 60 years ago, who lived with the Eskimos for a long time, came back to Boston, and they said, oh, no, you couldn't have just lived off animal products. So they said, okay, lock me away for, I think it was a year, and just feed me animal products. But he was eating brains, and he was eating bone marrow, and he was eating liver, and he was eating all the organs as well as the meat. And he did absolutely fine. He was healthier coming out than he was going in. And he was lock away carnivore, uh, where they locked him up and kind of threw away the key for a while to do the experiment. Uh, I can't remember what the guy's name is. I've got to look all those details up. Definitely. However. Sorry? Stephenson. Stephen, is that who it is? Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'm not, I've written about him. I've, I've talked about him. I just don't remember everybody's names. The point is that he was able to do that, but he was eating a lot of organs. And there are people, especially in this country, who are not comfortable eating organs. So the question is, was it safe? And I looked to someone like Sean Baker, who's a buddy of mine. Um, I call Sean the experiment because Sean mostly eats the muscles of animals. And Sean is been doing this for a very long time, many years, and he's getting healthier and healthier rather than the other way. So Sean is someone who's demonstrated, I know it's an anecdote, but um, he has demonstrated that. And based on Sean's experience, that's what allowed me to answer the question that I don't have to go ballistic with the organs and that it is safe long term. However, the caveat for me was that, okay, find a few things that are complete in terms of micronutrients. And one of the things, the most obvious answer is an egg. 
An egg is a complete chicken. So therefore, an egg has everything in it that is required to become a chicken. All the fat, all the protein, all the minerals, all the vitamins, all the elements to become a chicken. Now, we're not chickens, but we're pretty darn close in terms of our nutritional needs. And the interesting other thing, I'll bring my bariatric experience into this. With my obese patients, basically what I do with surgery is I do surgery that stops them from eating. I tell my patients on the day of their surgery, I'm about to kill your best friend. And, and the purpose here is to help people who can't lose weight by themselves to add this in as a tool. And when I look at those people, when I look at how little they eat in the beginning, if they can eat the equivalent of two boiled eggs a day, two boiled eggs a day, that is more than enough to keep them nutritionally replete. Think about how small an amount that is. Now, that doesn't make up their calories, but their calories are coming from their hips because that's what gets the weight loss. But from a nutritional, from a micro and macronutrient perspective, two eggs for the average human being is enough. Think about how small that is. Yeah. So I'll eat liver from time to time. I'll eat meat. I'll eat chicken. I'll eat fish. Um, mostly the muscles of the animals, but I'll eat the chicken skin. Um, I'll eat oysters or smoked, whatever it may be. Those are things that appeal to me, sometimes the smaller fish. And there is plenty of diversity in terms of nutrition in those foods. But my cheese, remember your baby, if you breastfeed your baby, your baby is going to be living off milk exclusively until you start introducing real food. And that baby is not just surviving, it's growing gangbusters, its brain's growing, its body's growing, and that's pure milk. So if you eat cheese from time to time, I add a little bit of heavy cream to my coffee. Sometimes, oh my God, whole milk. Yeah, I add a little bit of whole milk to my coffee from time to time. Those little things all count in terms of nutritional repletion because I don't use any supplements. I don't use any. But I also know by checking my blood work that I am completely replete, better so now, than 20 years ago when I was fat and eating everything. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, you know, would you tell a pregnant person to take folate or something like that? So that's a good question. Do they need to? Probably not. If they're on a, let's say someone on a carnivore diet or a keto carnivore diet, I call it an omni carnivore diet, where you're eating carnivore for your food, for your nutrition. And every now and then, if you enjoy, enjoy eating vegetables, that's fine. And my wife, as you know, is the same pregnant as you are. And that's basically what she does. Now, maybe this, some people look at this as a compromise. I don't know. But the two supplements that I put her on a couple of months before we decided to begin to get pregnant was a prenatal multivitamin and also a, um, some krill oil. Um, just to make sure she's getting enough three uh, omega fatty acids. So those are the two things. Are they necessary? Probably not. And this is more belief than science, but I wasn't quite ready to roll the dice. Yeah. But she's not on CoQ10. She's not on biotin. She's not on all the other garbage that her gynecologist her to eat with a Big Mac fries and a Dr. Pepper. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that a lot of the supplements that they put pregnant women on, is because of the crap they eat when it comes to what they call food. If you're eating real food, you probably don't need that. I just wasn't quite ready to do the experiment. But let's face it, we have a few hundred thousand years of evolution that is the experiment. You know, Australopithecus did not eat GNC stuff. Yeah. There wasn't a little GNC store. You know, and I'm from Africa. Um, when you walk down the Olduvai Riverbed, I, there's not a GNC on each corner. <laughs> so, so we must have done okay because not only did we survive, we evolved, particularly our brain, to be what it is now. We got better as a species in a very short period of time. And my biggest concern, even though it's an ultra short period of time, is we're actually stagnant right now and maybe even regressing as we go backward on the evolution of our diet. And we are our diet. Absolutely. It's the most important thing. So, and, you know, you see in the, in the, when Dr. Um, when the, uh, the dentist went to all the cultures and their teeth were wide and they were smiling big. And then 
later he went back and they had started eating junk from the that was imported and their teeth were all like <laughs> you know what's interesting is that every human species originally had straight teeth and it's because and, and you know I, i've actually done a podcast that will be dropping in the next uh, couple of weeks on exactly this the biggest issue is actually not the quality of the food that we eat but the biggest issue with the orient, with the change in our lower face is that the muscles of our face are no longer exercised as we're growing by chewing really tough stuff we used to eat gristle and meat and have to chew the heck out of that we used to eat vegetables that were rough and fibrous when we accessed them that required a lot of chewing we used our jaws to chew up food we now have all this mushy crap that we don't have to eat meat off the bone anymore you know when last did you see someone sitting there and eating it off the bone we don't do that anymore we don't exercise our facial muscles and our jaw top and bottom jaw is defined by the muscles around it just like our general muscles are defined by the use of our muscles and our bone strength comes as much from muscles and the tendons attached to it as it does from the integral calcium and deposition of the bone structure when you break your arm or you keep it in a cast your bones just wither away as much as your muscles wither away um, even if the rest of your body is preserved and and that's because of the lack of muscle tension same with our faces and that's why our teeth have become skew which is a great bonus for for dentists because they rip out our teeth all the time and put us in braces but you can have pretty straight teeth and and my prediction is this this is i'm going to be um prediction your baby and janae's baby my wife's baby are going to have straight teeth i hope so because this is not natural <laughs> no right mine is um but 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 it's and it's not very pretty uh, apart from those that were knocked out playing sport um but the point is that it's going to be my prediction is and it's going to hold me to this you know hold me accountable <laughs> but my prediction is if you um raise your baby early on in a ketogenic mind and my other friend uh, ken berry uh, nisha's just had a baby he's got uh, i think their baby is about just under 2 years of age teeth are straight teeth are straight no need to rip your wisdom teeth out i've got all four of my wisdom teeth and they're fine they're fine they took forever to turn my dentition is okay that's great so my prediction is and we're doing an n of 3 experiment as far as i know and i'd love to hear from your audience of other people who had babies on keto what do their teeth look like but it impacts so much and i think the key there is not just to feed them carnival but let them chew on stuff it's great they're far more likely to aspirate and choke on mashed potatoes than they are on a piece of steak or a piece of jerky that they're chewing on. Yeah, I think that that misconception that meat is so hard to digest and um but I definitely think that will be, you know, one of the first foods I give them, so. Right. Um so what do you see when you see people who are starting carnivore, what are some of the top mistakes they make? Well, you know what's interesting is that it depends on the personality type and and in my practice we really look at the personality type are you an all or nothing person or are you a little bit more permissive in terms of how you do things um because the authoritarian people take a headlong dive in the deep end of carnival and they will tolerate severe austerity for a while cuz a carnival diet if you just if you go from the standard american diet to pure carnival in one day it's miserable your body rebels your brain rebels your entire system rebels your blood sugar's bottom out you you feel like crap it's you might as well take your car a gasoline car and say you know what screw this gasoline today i'm putting diesel in my car <laughs> well how how well does that work so <laughs> the engine the engine just destroys itself and exactly the same thing happens with the human body if you suddenly go carnivore so the 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 advice i give is to do it slowly if this is going to be your way of life then it's got to last until 10 minutes after you die So you've probably got a very long time to do this. You don't have to do it all at once. So the first mistake I see is people diving into the deep end. 
and being perfectionist. Ease into number one. Number two is look at the spectrum of things that you like to eat in the carnivore diet. Don't eat the things you don't like but make sure there's a decent spectrum. But stop listening to people, the have-to people. There's so many people out there, the evan I call them the evangelists, who tell, oh, you have to do this, you have to do that. No, you don't. No, you don't. What, the only have-to for me, if you're fat, metabolic syndrome, or diabetic, is you have to stay away from carbohydrates if you choose to. But you know what? If you've had five DUIs and you're an alcoholic, and you say, I don't want to have another DUI, you have two choices. You either stop drinking or you stop driving. And I can't tell someone that they have to. But if you want to go carnival, one of the purposes is to get rid of the carbohydrates. So stay away from the carbohydrates and ease your way in. If your goal is to lose weight, you're going to crash and burn. If losing weight is part of the process, you're going to sustain it. And then the other part that I see people do is when they get rid of carbohydrates and go carnivore, is they don't replace emotion management skills and tools. And if they don't do that, when life throws curveballs at them, they're going to relapse. That's, so those are pitfalls that I see. And then the other pitfall is this, it's okay to eat vegetables. It's okay to eat vegetables from time to time, just stay away from the carbohydrate-laden vegetables. But if you enjoy vegetables from time to time, if you're in a restaurant and they put some asparagus on your plate, eat it, it's fine. Nothing bad is going to happen. Purism, perfectionism is one of the problems with the carnivore diet. The other, then the next part is how much should you eat? Nobody knows. <laughs> nobody knows. Nobody knows, nobody knows, nobody knows. So the first thing I'll tell you is if anybody ever tries to tell you how much protein, how much fat you should eat in a given day. They know nothing about human biology. So probably take what they tell you with a pinch of salt, which they probably tell you is bad for you. Um, but the beauty about carnivore is human beings are genetically and evolutionarily designed to be carnivore. So what we have inside of our body is a whole series of hormones that get released in response to, um, to the consumption of certain macronutrients in a carnivore diet. Saturated fat triggers four different hormones in our intestine and leptin from our fat cells. And it's a series by which soluble fat triggers those hormones. So when your brain says, oh, I'm hungry, I need food, put a whole bunch of food in front of you on the table. Okay? But all because your brain said you think you need to eat that. You don't have to finish it. Now, let your body slowly over time, over that meal, decide when you've had enough. And the trigger is saturated fat. So as you eat that saturated fat, it triggers those hormones, gets into your bloodstream, triggers leptin, and a signal goes from your belly to your brain that says, dude, you're done. And not when you're stuffed, but as soon as you begin to feel full, stop. Get up, go do something for a minute or two, come back to the table, and you find, you know what, I'm okay. So the other big thing with carnivore is learn to trust the fact that eating very little is going to be okay. I've never had someone call me up and say, hey, look, I've become the Olsen triplet. Please help me. Anorexia won't be the consequence of eating less. So eat until you, your body tells you biochemically, and it's kind of a, a queasiness rather than I'm stuffed. And stop at that point. But on some days, it might be six ounces. On some days, it may be 20 ounces. So if you think about this in the wild, there's no other animal that predetermines how many eat. That's true. They can eat. They eat until they're full. And whatever's left is left. But they don't predetermine how much they're going to eat. Get... When I'm walking in the, in, the, in the woods of Africa or the, or the savannah of Africa, I don't trip over um, the lion's little careful stash of scales where they measure out how much meat they're going to eat. <laughs> okay? No, yeah. they don't. And we human beings need to return ourselves to our biologic 
negative feedback routes where our body controls how much we eat. Exactly the same with water. Nobody should ever predetermine how much water they're going to drink. You start to drink, and at some point, through salt dilution, a signal goes from your belly to your brain that says your thirst is quenched and stop. To tell people how much water they drink is lunacy because you don't know. But that the reason we love to tell people how much is because carbohydrates are unnecessary for human survival, and therefore there is no feedback control. So the issue there is that there is no feedback control when it comes to carbohydrates. So we human beings are smart and we've created an artificial formula to help us to decide how much it's okay to eat when we can eat pretty much endlessly. And we call that portions and calories. So we use this mathematical formula to determine how much we should eat. So, so since you're pregnant, let me give you an example of how to understand this. I assume that if it works out, you're going to plan to breastfeed your baby. Okay. And you probably also are going to express breast milk and put it in a bottle so that maybe your husband or you or somebody else can feed the baby breast milk. Am I right? Same milk. What's the difference? No. There's a huge difference, and I'm going to urge you to understand this difference and apply this difference to when you feed your baby. What's the difference between feeding a baby breast milk from breast versus breast milk from the bottle? Well, maybe the <clears throat> there's a different connection with when you're nursing them as when they take a bottle. To a certain extent, but I mean, bonding is bonding. Whether I'm feeding my baby or my wife's feeding the baby breast milk, the bonding is still there. Here's the big difference. Your breast contains more milk than the baby could possibly drink. Neither you nor your baby knows how much it needs to drink. And you can't control it. Okay. So what happens is you put the baby to the breast. It's quite hard work for a baby to extract milk from the breast. It has to work pretty hard. So the flow is fairly slow. The baby drinks that milk. And at some point, the saturated fat in human breast milk has a very high saturated fat content in it. So it probably isn't saturated fat that's killing us, giving us heart attacks. Be that as it may, that saturated fat runs through the baby's intestine, triggers those hormones, goes back to the brain and says, dude, you're full. It might be two ounces, it might be four ounces, it might be six ounces, but you know what it is? It's enough. Yeah. Now, you've got to bottle feed the baby. Well, some arbitrary expert decided that maybe six ounces is what your baby needs. And you believe the expert, and you're a good mom, so you fill the bottle with six ounces, and you plug the baby in, and come hell or high water, he's going to eat six ounces of milk, <laughs> whether it was too little, enough, or too much. And you already at that very young age, you're completely defying genetically and evolutionarily built in satiety signals. I see. And then when the baby is now eating real food, finish your plate, finish your plate. You, you we teach ourselves to defy feedback signals at an extremely early age. Yeah, we, we don't trust Let ourselves. Feed, and you know what? When he's finished drinking that bottle of milk, when he says, dude, I've had enough, let him go Whether there's a little bit left. And if he still looks hungry, give him a little bit more. But he, let him decide. As long as it's your, your breast milk, let him decide. He yeah. will not die of starvation. That's a good... <clears throat> Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean... And, and carnivore restores us to that. If you allow yourself to... But people on a carnivore diet say, oh, well, I have to eat somebody, some... Expert told me I have to eat this amount of protein. I have to eat this amount of fat. Your body rebels against that. So that's another pitfall. Eat until you're full and then don't eat a long period of time. It might be too mad or oh mad. But the problem with hunger for a fat person, it's like an alcoholic saying, I need a drink. When an alcoholic says, I need a drink, it's never because they're thirsty. When I think, oh, I'm hungry, it's almost always an emotional event, not a nutritional event. Mm -hmm. So I tend to predetermine when I'm going to eat so that I can look forward to it. And I know that is a nutritional event once, maybe twice a day. Yes. The only, the only thing is, I mean, I work with a lot of women and I think they're so used to under eating or restricting that I sometimes tell them just eat, eat more than you think you need because they're just, they, because I don't want them to 
freak out and eat carbs because they didn't eat enough, you know, and they're so scared of eating any kind of portion. So I'm always like, especially when they're starting, just eat a little more than you think. And then later on, you can kind of figure it out. Well, I think, I think there's an important concept there. It is counterintuitive to think that food will ever make you fat. The whole purpose of those negative feedback signals is to stop you when you've had enough. You will not become fat to the point of harm if you eat food. Carbohydrates aren't food, they're a drug. Uh, yes. So there'll be days when you eat more, there'll be days when you eat less. But what I to exactly the same pattern, I love the fact that you do that. What I tell my patients is put more food in the middle of the table than you can possibly eat. Just mentally get used to the fact that you're going to have leftovers. And if you're okay with that, or if your dog eats your leftovers, don't ever try to finish, try to finish what you put in front of you. Some days you may finish it, but most often if you leave some food in the plate that you eat till you feel full, you've eaten enough. Nothing. And I don't have a quantity that I can tell you you have to eat. I can tell you it's a good idea to eat a little bit of fat with your protein to protect the protein. But other than that, I can't tell you how much. But your body can. <laughs> That's true. You got to learn to trust it again. Um, so what are some final like weight loss tips? People love, you know, their weight loss tips that you would tell somebody who's starting carnivore or like a keto carnivore diet. So the first thing is don't set a goal. Don't set a goal. Don't, don't set a goal of weight loss. Don't set a goal of getting rid of your type 2 diabetes. Don't set goals. Because when you reach it, what then? So this, this is a, the reason you became fat, the reason you gained that weight is because of a dysfunctional way in which you managed your life. The goal here is to alter and improve the fundamental foundation of who you are as a human being. And that is not something that has an endpoint. The two things that all humans beings strive for is health and happiness. And neither health nor happiness has an endpoint or has a measurable outcome. If you put yourself on a diet to lose 20 pounds, you may lose the 20 pounds, but it's coming right back. That's true. Because you haven't fundamentally changed your habits. This is about changing habits, and you can't break a habit you're still doing, and you can't form a new habit unless you do it every day. So focus on habitual change rather than calories and intentional starvation to reduce weight. Your body will automatically reduce weight when you treat it in a non-obesogenic way. When you stop eating for your mind, when you stop snacking, which is always an, a snack is always an emotional event, <laughs> okay? Um, when you start, re, when you return your body to eating for the nutritional value of food, and the true nutritional value is carnivore, and if you feel like vegetables because they're fun to eat, or you may even think they're important, that's fine. Stay away from carbohydrates, eat once or twice a day, don't snack, and don't have an input. But when you do things for nutrition, it is equally important that you do things for mental health. Something physically active, something spiritual, something creative, and empathetic human connection. And if you focus on those four things, they take care of your emotional needs, and your food will take care of your nutritional needs. And if you separate the two again, and you follow those two pathways, you will become healthier and happier every day. And if on the morning of the day you die, you wake up and you say, okay, what am I going to do today to make myself healthier and happier? You're going to be moving forward and life is not going to knock you backwards. Because the issue is not losing weight. The issue is developing sustainable habits. It's the sustainability that's the problem. That's great advice because most doctors don't talk about that side of it at all. Uh, the emotional side and the yeah, and that's such a big component. I mean, if you're just staying inside watching TV all day, you're going to be miserable. So, um, well, I'm just so excited that we got to do this. And you guys need to all go and follow Dr. Sivis. 
and his wife too. She makes videos about their pregnancy and they're coming up to have their baby. So stay tuned on their journey and uh, make sure and subscribe to my channel and leave a thumbs up on this video and ask a question and maybe he'll come back and do another one with us later on. So leave your questions down below. And I'm just so grateful. Thank you, Dr. Sivas. Really appreciate it. And it's been great getting to know both of you. And so we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much.